Great. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for some of those technical difficulties. So my name is Cheryl Clayman. I am an assistant professor here at the Marcus Autism Center in Emory University in Atlanta, and I'm thrilled to be able to come and chat with you all today about kind of our thinking here on comprehensive diagnostic assessments. Um, please feel free, if you have a question, to type it into the box as I'm going along. I want to make sure it's clear to all, and let me know also if you can't hear me or something else goes awry. Um, so I've been working in the field of autism since the mid-90s in uh, classrooms and then research and doing my PhD. And then I got my PhD at McGill University in Montreal and went down to the Yale Autism, uh, sorry, the Yale Child Study Center to do my pre and postdoc, where I kind of was taught by some of the greats in understanding autism, doing diagnostic assessments and the like. So hopefully I can share some of that with you today. I'm going to try and figure out how to go through these slides. But again, please let me know if you have any questions or anything. So um, I have to do some disclosures first. So I've been a consultant for Pearson on several of their measures, including things like the new violin that's out and the WISC-5 and things like that. I've done some consulting with Warner Brothers on some movies, and I have a book coming out from Wiley. So that's the logistics. So let's just go back to autism. So what is it? In the mid-1940s, Leo Kanner really defined autism as these difficulties with social relationships, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, play, imagination, difficulties with transitions and routines and the like. And really, this is still the way that we consider and think of autism today. And so when we're doing comprehensive assessments, these are still the kinds of things that we need to be considering when we're making those decisions on what tests we're going to use, what we're going to assess, and the like. Here is kind of an old slide, but I still just like it. I know that the DSM-5 has changed our thinking to really putting communication and social impairment together. But in many ways, what we need to do when we're thinking about comprehensive assessments is tease some of these apart. As you all know, when we think about autism, it's a very heterogeneous disorder. And so with that, we need to individualize our treatment plans for our kids. So what is their communication like? Do they, are they verbal? Are they nonverbal? What are their social skills like? Are they more aloof and passive? Or are they kind of in your face and don't know when to stop asking questions? Do they have a lot of secondary symptoms? How difficult are they with transitions? What kind of um, obsessive kind of behaviors do they have and the like. And so we really need to be thinking about all these things as we're determining our assessment and recommendations and stuff. And so when we think about all those symptoms, I mean really when we think about what that implies for an individual is really that their entire brain is involved. So we have the movement areas of the brain that are impaired, we think of the repetitive behaviors, we have all the under of the temporal lobe areas where we think of all the social features, we have the language areas of the brain, so it's a pretty kind of widely impacted disorder. I mean again when we think about this, again all these things need to go into thinking about mm -hmm. our diagnostic assessments. And so here's the other thing when we think about autism. So I already said that we're talking about an entire spectrum. Um, but these are also, it makes it a very difficult disorder to kind of think about doing comprehensive assessments to because there's just so much we need to know and think about and take into account. And so one of the things that we do need to also know about is really just normative social development. What is expected for individuals um, of different ages and levels of development? So just to kind of briefly go through normative social development, infants, like really, really young babies, come into the world and they're pre-wired for social engagement. So from the very, I mean, even in the womb, uh, babies are turning and responding more when they hear their mother's voice than when they hear other voices. When they're born, they're more interested in looking at moms and attending to moms and dads, but moms more just because they've heard their voices more over the course of the nine months that they were in the womb. But human voices and faces are the most interesting and salient features in a baby's environment. And then as they get a little bit older, they know when to start to selectively attend to things. They start to know when to be engaged in different social skills. They start to engage in back and forth babbling and that reciprocity that we see. You start to see them forming attachments and stranger anxieties. You start to see them forming all the social communication skills and then eventually starting to really develop peer relationships and the like as well. Um, 
if we think about autism, though, those social skills are really that core and defining symptom. And so when we're looking at doing a diagnostic assessment, what we really need to see is social skills that are more impaired than what would be expected given an individual's cognitive capacities or their developmental expectations. And we want to see that um, discrepancy between those social skills and their cognitive expectations. Some skills do emerge with time. So lots of times we might see an infant or a toddler that's quite aloof and they're very much in their own world. And if I could show videos and put videos up on these things, it makes it really, really clear. But if you have a chance, you can go check out video glossaries from Autism Speaks and Autism Navigator stuff from A.B. Weatherby and the like. But you might see babies that you can get right into their faces and they won't even seem to notice you're there, but then notice an M&M &M in the corner of the room. And then they might grow up and be a little bit more active but odd, so answering your questions but engaging in atypical behaviors as they're answering questions and the like. <clears throat> in autism, you might also see deficits in mutual gaze, in their joint attention skills, so sharing that attention with a another person, um, theory of mind, so understanding another's point of view, and their social intuition. So lots of times our kids might get into trouble because, you know, someone comes up to them to be their friend, and yet what ends up happening is they're really using them to engage in some behavior that they should not be engaging in. So here, take this bag and bring it over here or pass this note for me and that person will get caught rather than the people that are actually engaging just because our child with autism might want to have them as a friend. So if we think about the onset of autism, in most cases parents are worried about their child in the first years of their child's life. So by two, about 90% of parents have expressed concern. And they've expressed their concerns, but many times have been told, uh, wait and see, or you're just a boy. So it, it, you know, the delay in getting that diagnosis is happening because parents are kind of asked to wage up from their worrying in terms of this whole, though they might grow out of it phenomenon. But the most common presenting problems that parents bring forth to pediatricians or daycare providers or birth to three providers or whoever it might be would be language delays. So my child doesn't seem to be talking as much as other kids their age. I think my child is deaf and that mostly comes because they're not responding when I call their name or what we call social deviance. So we go, I take my child to the playground and instead of going and playing on the slide, they might be walking the perimeter of the playground and things like that. So given that parents are worried by the age of two, the average age of diagnosis is not until about four, four and a half or so years of age. And that's a huge delay that parents have to wait in order to be able to kind of figure out what's going on with their child. They're usually trying for those couple of years to, to understand and seeking out more and more help. Um, but then they've also had a delay in the start of intervention. So one thing we know is that autism only very rarely develops after the age of three. And so we need to really be considering those parents' concerns and making sure we're doing comprehensive diagnostic assessments as soon as parents are having different worries. So switching to the comprehensive diag evaluation, what is the purpose? So we want to help parents and help them understand what is going on with their child, help them understand, you know, does their child meet criteria for a diagnosis? If not, does their child need services in order to help with some of the delays that they might be seeing? It helps us with individualizing programming. So when we know their pattern of strengths and weaknesses, we can really help to figure out how to best support that child. It also serves as a baseline to measure change. So lots of times our kids might start out with an IQ of in the average range, but then because they have difficulty with um, listening skills or attending to tasks or they're not socially motivated to answer questions that someone's answering them, maybe their IQ will change over time. It could go up, it could go down depending on how their skill set is developing. So that serves as a nice baseline to start looking into are interventions working or not. So the number two is obtaining or clarifying the initial diagnosis. So a lot of times our families might want a second opinion. Um, they might want to check if you know, is my child making progress based on different things that we've been trying to do? Or, you know, many times they might be told that, no, this is not autism, particularly in individuals who are not of Caucasian descent, and they're told it's a behavior disorder, for example. Many kids of African-American descent are given disorders of behavior first, and then it takes another couple years for someone to say, no, this isn't behavior disorder, it's an autism spectrum disorder. 
So we want to be doing these evaluations and be really considering them comprehensively so we can really help our families from the first time they get an evaluation. And then they can be using their resources in order to obtain necessary interventions rather than just kind of continuing to seek out more and more and putting their resources into more and more evaluations. The other re reason is that lots of the times a child might need a diagnosis in order to obtain um, services. So they might not be able to get insurance coverage, for example, for certain services. They might not be able to be eligible for services in a school in order to, um, without a diagnosis. And then we also do them for research purposes, and we do a lot of those here, at least at the Marcus Autism Center, but across the country too. Um, what are individual profiles? How do we put them into different research experiments and things like that? So diagnosis, I mean, so everyone thinks that diagnosis is kind of the be all and end all, but really it's just the tip of that iceberg. And it's gonna be that gateway into getting the services that a child needs. And so we finally can get a child in for services and then um, we can help them open up the world of kind of assessments and interventions that must be necessary, that might be necessary. So what are the best practices for a diagnostic assessment? So first, it's led by a clinician that's experiment, experienced in developmental disabilities. So we need to know kind of what is typical and what is atypical in child development. If we're thinking about toddlers, for example, all toddlers do weird things. And so we don't want to be diagnosing lots of toddlers with autism just because they might cover their ears when they hear a sound that it's kind of a little bit more aversive or loud to them. We don't want to be diagnosing autism because we see a child toe walking. It's really someone that needs to know about what's expected in childhood and then to know about what those social skills are that are leading a child to be lower than what we'd expect given their cognitive abilities. We also know that we need to do a comprehensive assessment because many of the early behaviors that we might see, particularly in toddlers, overlap when we're thinking about um, diagnoses of language delay or intellectual disability and the like. So we really need to know and be able to tease those apart to say, yes, this is autism and it might have language delay, but it's the autism is the core, not the language delay is the core. We also need to think about all the domains that we want to test. Now obviously when you have a young child, there's only so many domains we can assess. But as we a child ages, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, there's many more things that we can look at to make sure we're targeting those intervention programs appropriately. Um, in terms of also thinking about best practices, the diagnostic assessment is really optimally assessed by using a combination of direct observation as well as parent interviews. And so the parents are going to give us a sense of what the child does on a regular basis in the home, in different settings. And the child is going to give us the information on kind of what they look like in a more novel environment, but being asked pretty standardized questions. School observations, if they can be done, are also hugely informative and really, really help with getting a good understanding of what a child is like with their peers. So in terms of recommended practice, the diagnostic process should be led with by a clinician that's experienced and working and knowledgeable about children with autism spectrum disorders. We very frequently we get children who come in and they've been given a diagnosis of autism from someone who really has not experienced working with children with autism before. And so they might just say that it's autism, but we're looking at them kind of across a broader lens and trying to better understand the behaviors that we're seeing. And so as we said, we should be getting information from standardized observations, so we think of our kind of cognitive assessments, speech and language assessments and the like, by the parent report, getting a good developmental history. As we know, and I said earlier, that autism rarely develops after the age of three. So in that case, we want to know kind of what was going on before three years of age with the child. We want to get all those structured observations in terms of their social skills, their communication skills, their play skills, and trying to probe for some of the repetitive behaviors as well. We want to get standardized assessments of their cognitive capacities, their language skills, their adaptive behavior skills. And then we want to use our best judgment because these tests are only going to be giving us pieces of a picture and we need as clinicians to really put them all together in order to um, best understand that child's strengths and weaknesses. There's many times where a child might score in the autism range on one of our tests, for example, but as a clinician we'd say it's because maybe they've been really shy or maybe they've had a traumatic experience or maybe their parents are going through a really hard time right now and so the child is acting more atypical. And so we need to be putting all of that together with our best judgment that we have. 
So in thinking about comprehensive diagnostic evaluations, we're going to be doing, we would start with a screening. So that might not happen in our office, but we might get a referral from somewhere that says, I think this child is at risk for developing autism or, or showing symptomatology that looks like it might be autism. Then we might do developmental assessments, cognitive assessments, get language assessments and the like. We'll do our history. We'll assess for that autism symptomatology get examples of their social, behavioral, and play presentations, and then we put that again all together. And many times we might be referring for other specialized evaluations. So maybe we'll say, oh, their feeding history shows evidence of difficulty with feeding, so let's refer them to a feeding evaluation or an occupational therapy evaluation if they're not part of your team and the like. So on the slide now are just areas of need to consider. Uh, and these came out of Bailey's 2008 paper. And it's a whole range of things. And obviously, if we were going to do this with every single child, our wait list would get even longer. Currently at the Marcus Autism Center, it could take you a while to get in for appointments. So we try and really streamline our assessments to help children right now determine if the child has an autism spectrum or not. And there's lots of other good people, once we have that diagnosis, that can do other of these assessments. So we might refer them on. But it depends on what your practice looks like. But these are the different areas that we might want to consider in doing our diagnostic evaluation. What are the challenges to assessment? So as we talked about, autism is a very, very heterogeneous disorder. So there's a broad range of syndrome expression. You might go in saying, I'm going to do these tests and I'm going to be all prepared. But then you get a child that's nonverbal, for example, and you're going to have to change your battery as you go through. So there's different levels of functioning, different profiles. Um, we might see one child that looks one way when we have a lot of structure, but then acts completely differently when we take away that structure. And then we might see changes in profiles over time. Kind of one of the things that we see a lot in autism is a lot of scatter. And those, that scatter can change over time as well. So it's things that we need to be kind of on the lookout for. So what is the gold standard? Um, so the screener gold standards are things like the MCHAT, the Modified Checklist for Autism and Toddlers, or the Infant Toddler Checklist. There's the Social Responsiveness Scale, the Social Communication Questionnaire, the CARS, the Childhood Autism Rating Scale. Those are different kinds of screeners that we can do. If we think about development or cognitive assessments, there's developmental tests like the Mullen Scales of Early Learning or the Bailey. There's also the, the Weschler Scale, so the WIPC, the Preschool and Primary Scale of Intelligence for the younger kids. In older kids, we might have the WISC scales or the Stanford Binet, the Differential Ability Scales, the KABC. There's a lot of choice we can use. Um, and we can talk about, if you guys are interested, in how we make some of those choices. But a lot of times, it depends on the purpose of your assessment. So if I'm trying to get a good estimate of IQ, I want to do the best test that's going to give me the best um, understanding of that child's IQ. So we use a Differential Ability Scale a lot here. And one of the reasons for that is it's got a lot less language demands than something like a WISC. It also has a lot more teaching opportunities. So I feel like when we do the DAS, we can get a good sense of, after some teaching, what a child's abilities are like. There are weakness to, weaknesses to it as well, but that would be some of the things that you're considering. The Stanford Binet can be hard for a lot of our kids, but maybe it would be helpful if you have an environment where your child is needing to transition a lot, what do they look like? The Stanford Binet has a lot more transitions to just doing the test in and of itself. So sometimes you want to choose your test based on kind of the demands that your child needs to be put in. Sometimes you need to do it for best estimate of diagnostic assessment. So there just could be different reasons. And, and you could be thinking about that as you're putting your battery together. Um, to save time, I'm just going to you know, quickly go through the rest. But there's just lots of different choices and assessments that we're using. So there's speech and language assessments, the adaptive behavior assessments. Uh, diagnostic history uh, assessments. So there's the ADIR, which is the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised, which is a great assessment, but it's also extremely lengthy. So if you have all the time in the world, it would be a great measure to get a really nice understanding of a child's current history and past history. But many times people, particularly in the clinical world, don't have time or resources that able to do the ADIR. So a good clinical interview would suffice for that as well. Then there's diagnostic assessments. There's the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. We're on the second edition now, which I use a lot of the times and really like. And there's other ones like the AOC and other just kind of more freestanding diagnostic play sessions or interviews, which are also um, available. And then we do a record review, so looking at their prior reports, school reports, and other observations and the like. 
So just quickly through screening and early detection, um, these are really important because the earlier we can identify children on the autism spectrum, the earlier they can get mobilized and be getting into treatment services to help. And we know that the earlier the intervention, the best outcome our kids have. So who's on the front line? Essentially everyone. If we have concern about a child not meeting their developmental milestones, they really should be referred for services or for assessment. Um, we talked about some of these, but there's just a range of different screeners and checklists that can be used and more coming up all the time. And it's what a lot of our research here is doing. So hopefully we'll be able to share more of that in a future webinar once we have a good tool that we can, we can share that way. Um, and here it just goes through some examples. Most of the screeners, what's nice about them is they're super quick to do and they're super easy to score. And so there's not a lot of excuses why we can't do something, but that information then needs to be portrayed to the parents and then the child needs to be referred for further assessment. So there's the, the modified checklist for autism and toddlers. Um, the screeners are not necessarily the best at differentiating autism from other things from other disorders, but it certainly picks up most kids that are at risk for something, so they're good in that respect. Um, in terms of psychological assessments, I talked about earlier that it's the baseline for intellectual functioning. Oh, you get a baseline first of intellectual functioning because that's what we're comparing our other skills for. Um, and as we said, great scatter is the norm, so I'm going to go through a little bit of that, what we see. I talked a little bit about this in terms of selecting the instrument, and we can go in more detail if you guys want, just let me know. But the things that you want to consider are the level of the language skills required in order for a child to be able to com conduct or complete that instrument that you're giving. How complex are those instructions? When you have really, really wordy instructions with a child whose receptive language is pretty low, you're going to not know, are they not able to do the task because of their receptive language skills or because of the task? Um, so we want to really try and tease that out. How much structure are you allowed to give or is required for the task? How much are social demands? So sometimes computerized IQ tests work better for our kids than social, more like sitting at a table traditional IQ tests. Again, if, that would be good if you want to really get an assessment of their top end of their abilities, but it might not be anything of how they perform in a day-to-day -day environment. Uh, use of time tasks. A lot of our kids just don't care about timing. And so if the IQ score depends a lot on how fast they do something, this might not be the best estimate of a child's IQ. And the lever of motor involvement. Some of our kids have a really hard time with motor control. So what demands are, are on it that might kind of decrease their performance? So again, depending on what you choose, the child's performance might be optimized or might be diminished. So here's some examples. Um, we've gone through kind of all the general IQ tests, but there's also a range of nonverbal IQ tests that we can use as well. The difficulty in using a nonverbal IQ test is that that tends to be the area where lots of our kids shine on things like nonverbal reasoning abilities. And if we only test their nonreasoning, nonverbal reasoning abilities, we're missing out a huge component, particularly of what needs to happen in a classroom of their verbal skills. So it might be a good estimate kind of of what their ultimate potential is, but it's leaving out a huge part of what we need to survive in our environment in these days. In terms of thinking about IQ tests as well, is IQ is not necessarily the most stable until about eight years of age. And so we're very careful about diagnosing intellectual disability, for example, in children that are under the age of six. We'll call it more develop, global developmental disability until we think the IQ is a little bit more stable and we have a really kind of good accurate estimate of a child's IQ. So when you're doing cognitive assessments as well, just as important as the scores that you're getting is also the behavioral observations that you're making. And these behavioral observations are also really going to go into informing kind of your recommendations that you make. So if we think about self-regulation, how easily are they able to tolerate frustration? If they can't handle any frustration, that's probably going to lead them to having um, increasing behavior problems in a classroom because it's expected that we're going to be kind of pushing them to their limits. So how well can they regulate that? What are their metacognitive skills like? Are they able to instruct themselves? Let's so say, okay, first I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Um, you know, I'm going to get a break after I get this. So they can kind of talk themselves through things, soothe themselves in some ways. 
Uh, how good are they at self-monitoring? So correcting themselves as they're doing a task so they know that they made a mistake and can they correct that? Are they able to evaluate, you know, this is easy, this is hard, oh, this is getting harder for me, things like that. Are they able to advocate for themselves, saying this is too hard, I need to take a break, can we take a break now? Or I just don't know the answer to that. A lot of our kids have a really hard time with just saying, I don't know. Uh, and so sometimes if we teach them that, then they can kind of continue to do that throughout the assessment. Um, but these are some of the things that we're looking for um, because they should be part of recommendations as well. In terms of thinking about their flexibility, how good are they in, you know, if something's not working for them, are they going to change the way that they're doing a task? How good are they when they get feedback and can they monitor it? When we think about the differential ability scale, we give them feedback on that. And can they change how they're responding to a task based on that? How good are they? How long can they sustain their attention to a task for? How good are they at inhibiting their responses? As you're putting task items out, are they able to wait until you give them the instructions? Are they able to wait for instructions before they're pointing out an answer? Things like that. How good are they at perseverating on a task? So in terms of the good perseveration of where they try hard until they are able to complete something, but also, do they just continue to give the same answer over and over again? Lots of our kids will pick item number one over and over and over again, and we can't get them to change out of that kind of response set. And how efficient or inefficient are they at responding? And again, all these things can just go into thinking about your recommendations. So intellectual disability, the first thing that we kind of try and rule out, it's a comorbid and about 30 to 35 or so percent of children with autism spectrum disorder. So that's a, a huge change. In the past, it was comorbid about 75 percent of the time. So, you know, 10 years ago or so, anytime you made a diagnosis about the child was about 75 percent likely to also have a diagnosis of intellectual disability. Now we make that comorbid diagnosis about 30 to 35 percent of the time. So earlier diagnosis and earlier intervention could be helping with this, but we're also better at diagnosing the broad spectrum now as well. So if we think about intellectual disability, um, we think about deficits in cognitive functioning. So we talk about scores about 70 on an IQ test or below. They also have to have um, comorbid deficits in adaptive functioning. So if we do a test like a Vineland or an adaptive behavior assessment scale, we need to see deficits also below the 70s in um, the, the adaptive behavior domain. And for intellectual disability, we also need to see that onset early in development. Otherwise, we can think about other kind of disorders that are going on. And so we do have severity levels of cognitive functioning that help us kind of predict um, you know, a child's potential. Um, but again, we don't want to be thinking about intellectual disability before a child is six to eight years or so of age. So here's the normative curve for anyone that might not have seen it, and we're talking about 85 to about 115 as being in the average range, below 70 being intellectually, in the, in, having an intellectual disability, and above 130 being intellectually gifted. So that's just that curve. So here we've talked about some of these, but there's the Weschler scales. They're, you know, they're normed on kids about two and a half to adulthood, and it's the most traditional IQ measure that we have. Here's just a look from um, a book that Dr. Solnier and Ventola put out in 2012, and they just were showing some of the differences in individuals with autism and their profiles on a WISC. So if we think about and these are just kind of examples of what it might look like. So if we think of prototypical autism, if you have a child with comorbid intellectual disability, what you pretty much see is their verbal abilities being less uh, developed than their perceptual reasoning abilities. And their greatest strengths are on things like matrix reasoning or block design, and their greatest weakness is in comprehension. And when we think about comprehension, that's really a measure of, on a lot of the questions anyways, of social reasoning skills. So it's no surprise that that would be their weakness. But we can see that we have scores in kind of that low end of, below, below average range, low end of average range to in perceptual reasoning skills, and then extremely low in the verbal comprehension abilities. And that processing speed is also picking up on the fact that kids don't really care so much about timing, but the coding subtest will also be getting at some of their graphomotor difficulties that they might have.
If we look at the next column, which is prototypical autism without comorbid intellectual disability, we again see a similar pattern, but obviously those scores are significantly higher. So that comprehension, again, is a significant weakness for our kiddos. And things like matrix reasoning and block design tend to be nice areas of strength. If we think about the kind of the old definition of Asperger's syndrome, which we think we can still tease apart, it's a little bit reversed. So our verbal comprehension abilities are higher than our perceptual reasoning ability. So more thinking along the lines of like a nonverbal learning disability uh, and the like. But we see strengths in kind of their verbal comprehension with some relative weaknesses in their perceptual reasoning skill. But their IQ tends to be nicely within the average range. So the differential ability scales is, again, the one that we mostly use here. It goes from two and a half to 17 years, 11 months, and it gives you the three factors that we like to see. So it's splitting apart the verbal and nonverbal skills, which is necessary in assessing our kids on the autism spectrum. And as I said before, it's less verbally demanding than the WISC. It also has fewer time constraints than the WISC. There's ways of doing every subtest with and without. Uh, ones that have timing with and without that timing component to calculate their cognitive abilities. There's a nice use of manipulatives on it, so lots of our kids like to use all those objects and handle them. So even in some of the verbal tasks, there's little toys and stuff so that you can assess some of their verbal comprehension abilities. And there's somewhat less of an emphasis on attention and memory demands on it. Here's the lighter um, international performance scale. So this is a non an example of a nonverbal test for our kids. Um, so there's no language. You kind of pantomime out the instructions. It's just a bunch of cards or little shapes and things like that. Um, and it's really getting at nonverbal processing abilities. Um, and it goes from kids that are about age 2 to 21. If we think of our developmental assessments, there's really two out there now. The Mullen Scales of Early Learning, which is what's used mostly in research. There's a nice large age range in it, so it goes from birth to 60 month, 68 months of age, and it divides the test into different domains. So you have visual reception, which is like your non-verbal reasoning domain, gross and fine motor skills, and then your ex expressive and receptive language skills as well. Um, it's used in research a lot because it has this nice wide range. It's nice for a lot of our kids who are slightly older but don't have a lot of language yet, so we can still do more of a developmental test with them. However, it has not been normed since the mid-90s, so rumor has it they're thinking about renorming it again now, which would be really nice. There's also the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development. So this one's also, I really like this assessment. It only goes to 42 months, so it's got a narrower age range than the, the Mullen. The other domain, particularly as kids get older, we might want to look at is neuropsychological assessments. And so there's lots of batteries for this as well. So we think of the, the NEPSI, which is a neuropsychological assessment, the second edition. There's the Dallas Kaplan. Oh, I'm seeing a question come through. Hold on, Melissa. Would you ever substitute a cognitive with an interview? So the question is, I don't know if everyone can see them. If you can, let me know and I won't read them. But in terms of, subs the question is about substituting a cognitive with an interview if the child was unable to achieve a standardized score. So we don't do that a lot here. Um, a lot of the times we find our parents have a hard time estimating, and we're getting the estimate of kind of functioning from a parent by doing something like a Vineland interview, for example. Um, so I would try other tests if, if you need to have a cognitive score. And so we can usually drop down enough to get something. So if we have a five-year-old who doesn't have language yet, we can still do a Mullen, for example. Does that make sense? Um, let me know if, if you want me to clarify that even more. Oh, thank you. So for thinking about neuropsych assessments, so there's, again, there's a whole bunch of them that you can choose from, and there's checklists as well. But a lot of the kids on the autism spectrum have a lot of difficulties with executive functioning, so all that planning and organizing um, and things like that. And so there might be a reason that we'd want to assess in greater depth their neuropsych kind of abilities as well. ADHD is also... It's newly, we're newly able with the new diagnostic manual to diagnose ADHD in conjunction with autism. In the past, um, there was a stipulation in our diagnostic manual that you couldn't diagnose ADHD alongside of autism. But they've taken that out because they realize that some kids with autism, there's no reason why you can't have both disorders, so there's no reason to take it out. But what we need to be careful of is that we need to make sure we're thinking about ADHD and not just a child with autism who is more self-involved and not interested in, you know, kind of 
if we're thinking more of the inattentive type, for example, that they're inattentive because they can't be attending rather than inattentive because they're not interested in attending. So I hope that makes sense. So we need to be really teasing those things apart too. So the ADHD scales and observations also come in really handy. So here's just a list of different domains that we might want to test, and I'm happy to go into any of them in greater detail if you want. But for the sake of time, I'm going to just keep moving right now. Um, there was also a lot of neuropsychological concepts that have come up in the past that you guys might have heard or not, but one kind of common concept was the, weak, the, the theory of weak central coherence. And this was you know, even stated by Kanner of the inability to kind of understand the gestalt. So you, know, you, you can't see the forest for seeing the trees. Um, and lots of our kids will point out little, little things but not get the big picture. So that might be something that we want to assess as well. Um, and also we talked about executive function, um, but these are all the areas that we might want to be thinking about. There was also a lot of debate, particularly in like the 90s and stuff, on nonverbal learning disability. And so those might be things that we want to tease apart, particularly if we're thinking of a higher functioning kid with maybe a more Asperger type profile. So in addition, I'm sorry, I keep feeling I'm just talking a lot, but it's important to assess things like testing the limits. So what can a child do with minimal support and structure? And then how can we add on that structure to see how much they really need? Um, and we might go so far as doing some hand over hand or physical prompting stuff to see what could be helpful, particularly as we think of all the interventions available um, that have been put out there for children on the autism spectrum. Um, if we're thinking about learning readiness skills as well, these are also important to assess, particularly in our younger kids. Is a child even able to sit at a table yet? Can they show you that you know, ready response, like hands in your lap, now listen? Because these are things that happen in preschool programs all the time that can get our children kind of behind in the classroom performance. How good are they are at attending to adult instruction? Can they tolerate it when an adult tells them what to do or changes their task or moves something around the room and things like that? How good are they at eye contact? Are they attending even if they're not making eye contact? Because some of our kids might be listening a lot and getting a lot in, but they might not be showing that they're attending. So we want to kind of try and tease those apart too. And how good are they at imitation? And one of the things I like to think about is if I have a child that's a good imitator, I'm going to want them to be in a classroom, for example, that has other kids that don't have an autism spectrum disorder because I'm hoping that they're going to imitate and the behaviors of the other kids that don't have an autism spectrum disorder in the classroom. So all those things really are those building blocks of learning that a child needs in order to be successful in a classroom. So we're going to want to assess them even though they're not part of our WISC or they're not part of you know, our differential ability scale and things like that because they're really important. They form the building blocks of learning that we need to see. Um, so one of the things, and if you want more information on this, there's a webinar also on this site uh, from Dr. Solon Solnier, who really goes into a lot of good detail on cognitive ability and adaptive functioning. Um, but lots of our kids on the autism spectrum, and she says this really eloquently, have cognitive abilities perhaps up here, and their adaptive be uh, behavior skills are well below that. And it's really that thing that gets our kids, have, gives them difficulty in achieving to their potential. Um, if you don't have good hygiene and you go on a job interview, you're going to be less likely to get that job. Um, if you can't show up to something on time, those are all adaptive behaviors. And even if you're a genius and you can't do those things properly, you're not going to be able to hold down a job and have independent living. And so that's what we're trying to also tease apart. And unfortunately, many of our kids have a really discrepant ability. So we need to make sure it's part of their education programs. So there's a few different measures of adaptive behavior functioning, and there's the Vineland, which is the most common. We're on the third edition now. It goes from birth through 90 or so years of age, and it looks at adaptive behavior across a variety of different domains. Um, and I just said this, but um, that gap between their cognitive abilities and adaptive functioning really also widens as a child gets older. So it's really imperative to be monitoring adaptive skills and making sure we're adding adaptive behaviors to a child's program as we see deficits in their adaptive behaviors. Because really, again, that's going to be what holds our kids back. 
And so here's just a slide that shows kind of that deficit. So that dotted red line is their developmental quotient, or you can think of it as their IQ. And what we can see is kind of those deficits in adaptive behavior in the different domains. So the blue or purple domain line is their communication abilities. And so we really see like decent communication up through four, and then it really starts to slide off, particularly if we think of the demands that are needed. We need someone to really be able to converse with someone. We need them to be able to deliver messages and things like that, and those are harder for our kids. The social skills as well, it's well behind what their cognitive abilities would be, and then the DL is their daily living skills. So if we think of moving to speech, language, and communication assessments, I'm going to fly through this one because I also know you've had other, there's other webinars available on these as well. Um, but these are just some of the things that we might want to make sure are being assessed in a, in a communication assessment. So these are done by our speech and language pathologists here, but we really try and get a sense of really comprehensively of a child's communication abilities, including things like ability to do a narrative, um, including things like their understanding of non-literal language. So do they understand sarcasm and teasing? What's their understanding of non-literal language like figures of speech? You know, it's raining cats and dogs outside and the like. So here's just a list of some sample speech tests, which I'm just going to put through. Um, in very young children, the communication and symbolic behavior scales are something that we use here, and also the preschool language scales as well. Um, so when we're thinking about social communication skills, which also need to be assessed, are kind of what is a child's knowledge of their conversational rules? Can they initiate conversation? Can they sustain it? Can they stay on topic without going off on tangents? How do they end conversations? Can they ask questions? Can they only talk about their own perseverative interests? Things like that we're looking at. Again, can they self-monitor? So a common theme from, from before. But can they monitor their eye gaze? How is their voice modulation, their prosody? Um, do they engage in echolalia or other stereotypic behaviors? Um, can they monitor if I'm looking bored and yawning or pulling my chair back? Are they able to read those cues? So now diagnostic assessments. Um, so again, we talked about screeners a little bit. So those are, again, just the risk factors. And they help us detect red flags, um, but it's not a diagnostic evaluation. And the the um, sensitivity will be really high, but the specificity, so their ability to really distinguish autism from something else is pretty low. Um, we're going to get information from behaviors of parents and schools. We might use checklists or rating scales, or we'll just use more open-ended um, interviews. And we're going to do those direct assessments in order to get samples of the symptomatology that we might see in autism. Um, so here's just kind of how we get developmental history. So we want to know, have they met their milestones? We want to know their behavioral history. Have they been an easy child to care for? Have they been too easy to care for? Because lots of our kids, parents will report that they could play for hours on time without needing anybody to kind of engage with them. Or are they one of those super colicky kind of babies? Again, nothing specific necessarily to autism, but we're starting to put together a whole package to better understand what's fitting together for this child. What is their medical history? Lots of our kids have histories of feeding difficulties, um, ear infections, things like that. We're just trying to put it all together. Is there a family history? Is there a family history of autism or autism-related conditions? What has their educational history been like? Have they had trouble remaining in a preschool program or anything like that? We get histories again. Doing a good clinical interview is the way we really recommend it, but structured interviews are also available. So this is just a little bit of information on the ADIR. Um, it's semi-structured, but as I said, it's really, really lengthy. It can take between two to three or so hours to do the interview. It was really developed as a research tool, so it gives us lots of great information with regard to understanding all the symptoms we might want to see and anything we might want to key to different behaviors we might be looking at in our research experiments. But currently, it's also key to the dsm 4 so it'll give you information on the three kind of domains that we used to look for when we were making a diagnosis of autism and hasn't been updated yet to the DSM-5. It takes a lot of training, um, but it gives you a good reliability when you code the behaviors and the algorithm is good. And again, it's really comprehensive, but it'll take you a long time to do. Here's a, a picture of the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, um, which is one that we do do in pretty much every single diagnostic evaluation that we do here. It 
Oh, I'll just switch it. There's five modules for the, the ADOS. It's been revised in 2012. So the original ADOS had modules one through four that went for kids from about 18 months up to a, a adolescents and adults that went all the way through. And in the new revision, they've modified some of the algorithms and things and also added a toddler module, which has been, to me, a fantastic addition. So the toddler module um, goes between about 12 months and goes up to 30 months if a child doesn't have a lot of speech. There's a lot of codes that you give, but it gives you nice diagnostic uh, algorithms as well. So the things that we want to look for, whether you're doing an ADOS or you're doing something else, is kind of how a child plays with toys. Are they exploring toys in a way that's typical for a child their age and developmental level? So we might see a lot of mouthing, but if a child's developmentally at about 12 months of age, we'd be expecting a lot more mouthing. But if they're older and then they're mouthing and biting objects and not engaging with them appropriately, that's important information. Do they engage in cause and effect play? So, you know, instead of being able to do kind of more pretend play with things, are they really only playing with more of those cause and effects? So I push a button and something happens kind of toys. Are they using toys in a more functional manner? So using a toy for what it's intended. So I'm going to drive a car. I'm going to talk on the phone. I'm going to build blocks. I'm going to, um, um, yeah, feed a baby doll, things like that. Or are they able to engage in more symbolic and imaginary play? So using a toy for something it's not. So they might put like some string on a plate and say, look, it's spaghetti. I'm going to feed the baby, things like that. Or will they use little figures to act things out? So they'll have the baby doll pick up, or the mommy doll pick up a spoon and pretend to feed the baby doll and things like that. So we're looking at those different levels of play. And play tends to be really linked to language development. So we see a lot better play skills with a child that has better language development. So we talked about some of this, but a lot of people now, because we're screening at younger ages and we're able to identify children at younger ages, what does autism look like in toddlers, um, particularly toddlers between one and two years of age? So many parents, as I said earlier, are concerned by two years of age, so that's about 90%, but about 70% or so of parents are diagnosed even young, are concerned about their child even younger than that. And so as soon as a parent is concerned, we really need to be able to mobilize in order to conduct a diagnostic evaluation on that child. We do know that diagnosis is reliable when you have a person that's um, experienced in diagnosing toddlers as young as 15 to 18 months of age. So if that diagnosis is reliable, we really should be thinking about you know, helping a family uh, assuage their fears by pro providing them with a diagnostic assessment at that time. So again, it's even more, sure, one second, Melissa. Uh, it's even more important under the age of two that your clinician working with the child really knows about typical development as well as symptoms of autism. So Melissa just asked if I can give an example of a standardized observation. So one of the tools that we do use is the ADOS, so the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. And that test will give us a whole bunch of activities that we have to do over the course of about 30 to minutes to an hour, and it's, you know, we might do bubbles, for example, and we have a way of doing bubbles where we're going to blow the bubbles and then we're going to wait, and we're going to wait to see what do they do when they want more bubbles. Um, so that's standardizing that behavior so we can see what the child does in those occasions. Or we might call their name, and we're going to call their name a certain number of times in a specific way and see how they respond to that. So there's a whole set of standardized things that we do in order to observe the behaviors. Um, so just thinking again about diagnosing autism under the age of two, so we're going to do those same things, but one of the things we know is that not all symptoms of autism are necessarily present at that young age, particularly if we're thinking of some of the repetitive behaviors and standard uh, stereotypic behaviors and the like. So we're going to want to also really make sure we're doing a really comprehensive clinical interview to better understand those behaviors. Um, Um, and younger kids, the symptom expression, because a lot of those behaviors are not necessarily all coming online, if we think about autism as a developmental unfolding of, over time, the behavioral symptoms might start to manifest more at about a year, 18 months, when a, ch when a parent first becomes concerned, but then they continue to unfold over time. So if we think of a child that maybe is becoming more object-focused, 
Um, so say, you know, they might be babbling or they might be giving good eye contact and things like that, and there's no concern prior to the age of 12, but then they're not starting to develop language. And so now they're not really developing a lot of language, and then maybe they start to, you know, become more focused on objects. And now as they're becoming more focused on objects, they're really not showing an interest in their peers. So it's kind of autism is begetting kind of a continued symptomatology that's expressing more of the autism symptoms. And that's what we really need to understand and what makes it harder to diagnose these toddlers early, but we also just need to be more educated, I think, in, in what are those behaviors that we'd expect and the frequency of behaviors that we see in typically developing kids that we might not be seeing in a child with autism. And things like that. So there tends to be more subtle symptomatology. Um, we're seeing, we might be seeing higher functioning kids. Their language delays might not be quite apparent yet. Um, a lot of parents will talk about a plateau or a regression after about 18 months, and that's where a lot of the, you know, my child went for their 18-month shots, um, and then they stopped talking. But a lot of the times what it was is that, you know, their language didn't continue to progress as what would be expected. Um, the things that we need to start to differentiate early on are global and severe developmental delays versus autism spectrum disorder or language impairments versus autism spectrum disorder. Does a child have more sensory abnormalities, so visual or hearing impairments versus autism? Um, we have a lot of siblings who present with autism-like symptoms but might, might not meet um, a full diagnosis, so things like that. So we talked a little bit about this, but there really is pretty decent stability in diagnosis. So this data really came prior to the new um, diagnostic manual, um, but we're very good when we make an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So this really came from before we made an autistic disorder diagnosis. Um, pretty much what happened was that we might at that point there was shifts within the spectrum. So someone who might have gone from PDD and OS diagnosis to an autism autistic disorder diagnosis, but now we just really say since we're calling everything autism spectrum disorder, kids are essentially still meeting diagnostic criteria. Um, and there's even long-term stability, so at, you know when you diagnose it between two and four at nine years of age, kids are still remaining on the autism spectrum about 90 percent of the time. So I think this is the last category, behavioral assessment. Um, so the other thing we might want to look at is their behavior and kind of what um, is kind of inhibiting. So a lot of the times when we think of secondary symptoms in autism, so we might think of aggression, we might think of um, tantrum behaviors and things like that, a lot of those are harder for parents to deal with than the autism itself. And so we might need to do an assessment of their, you know, behaviors that they're engaging in. And so there's ways of doing and assessing for behavior change and the things that you might want to look at is how a child responds to positive versus negative reinforcement, um, do they respond better to punishment and things like that, and to make recommendations for how to increase behaviors that are desirable and decrease behaviors that are less desirable. Um, so there's ways of doing this. One of them is called a functional behavior assessment. Um, which you're looking at the antecedents to the behavior, the actual behavior itself, and then what happens as a result. So these might be ways, and there's structured interviews and things like that that you can use to do good functional assessments of behavior. Um, one of the things we like to stress, though, is all behavior is a form of communication. And so when we're thinking about that, what we need to try and understand is what that child is trying to communicate to us based on that behavior. So we shouldn't be thinking, particularly our kids with autism, that maladaptive behaviors are willful or malicious behaviors just to get under our skin. My, you know, 9 and 11 year old kids do that. They don't have an autism spectrum disorder, but sometimes they're just doing something that they know is going to get under my skin. But in our kids with autism, we don't want to just assume that the behaviors that they're doing are willful or malicious. So we really want to look at why. Why is a child behaving in that way? Are expectations too hard for them? Are we, you know, making our expectations based on our understanding of their cognitive abilities, yet we only have an estimate of their nonverbal cognitive abilities? And so maybe our language demands are too high for that child. And so what we really need to do is manage these maladaptive behaviors in the context of a comprehensive intervention program. And so if we're seeing a lot of behaviors, we're going to want to adjust that environment to try and see if we can see modifications in their behaviors. 
Um, the other thing that we see a lot of, particularly in our higher kind of cognitive functioning kids and our high, higher language kids, are comorbid psychiatric issues. So we might see high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, more rigid behaviors. We might see more social inappropriateness. So lots of our kids might get in trouble for, you know, not understanding the non-literal cues and going up to a girl, for example, in their teenagehood years and just thinking they can touch them inappropriately. And so we need to really be working with that and managing that and helping them understand kind of the consequences of those, but also understanding why they're going through puberty. They think that girl is cute, so, you know, maybe I can touch them. My mom lets me give her a hug, and I don't understand that. I'm not having a great ability to kind of generalize what I can do at home versus what I can do in public. So we do. We really need to assess for emotional health in our older um, like kids, as particularly as they're starting to go through puberty. So we talked about anxiety, depression. Lots of our kids are at risk of social victimization. Uh, they might have a lot more anger or aggression, and we need to be kind of understanding those. Um, and understanding their awareness into their own emotional experiences. What is their self-awareness like? What is their understanding of others? How good are they, are they at regulating their emotions? Can they modulate all the sensory information coming into them? Are they able to tolerate when things aren't going their way? Or if you have a field trip and that field trip is canceled because it's raining, how, how are they able to manage these things? And again, we talked about it before, but how good are they at self-advocating? Because the better our kids can self-advocate, the higher their tolerance or threshold levels are going to be because they'll be feeling a little bit more in control of their situation. So the other thing we have are specialized evaluations, which I'll just touch on briefly so we can end on time. But occupational and physical therapy, lots of our kids have difficulty with fine and gross motor skills. Um, handwriting can be a real challenge for lots of our kids. Clumsiness, trying to get them onto sports teams and phys ed and thing can be a big problem. So we need to be making sure we're monitoring for this. Lots of our kids also might have comorbid learning disabilities, um, particularly if we think about our our kids, they might be able to really develop the rote skills needed for reading, for math, um, but then when it comes to understanding what they're reading or making more inferencing as they're getting higher in uh, grade, um, and that's kind of the academic requirements, those things can really throw them off. So we need to make sure that, okay, we've tested them at, you know, in first grade and they're doing great in all their academics, but we need to make sure we're monitoring that, particularly as the demands become more abstract. If we think of neuropsych evaluations, which we talked about, that's a common referral that we make as well. And then medical evaluations. We're almost always referring for hearing tests. Genetic testing is the current best practice. So any kid that we diagnose, particularly if they have comorbid developmental delays, we're going to refer for genetic testing. Um, and then a lot of our kids have abnormal EEGs, so we want to refer them for neurological testing as well. And then comorbidities. Lots of our kids also have tics and other compulsive behaviors that we're going to want to see about managing. And psychopharmacology, um, so thinking about medications for our kids might be something that we also might need to recommend, whether it be for their attentional capacity or some of the aggressive behaviors or uh, some of their anxiety and things like that. So, um, We've talked about a lot of this, but these are just kind of the things that we need to make sure we're either ruling out or ruling in, because some of them, again, are more difficult than the autism itself. So if we have a child that has autism plus ADHD, we're going to want to make sure we're managing the ADHD just as much as we're managing the autism, for example. And then finally, um, once we do our comprehensive assessment, we have to write our comprehensive report. It's usually the bane of our existence. and. Um, we're working on getting things more templated and more comprehensive because what we were realizing when we used to write 30 page reports was that nobody was ever reading the 30 pages that we were writing uh, and that were also taking us months to get out. Um, so we want to make sure in that report the most important thing is really the summary. Um, what is going on with this child? How do we integrate all our findings together? What is the diagnosis? And then just as important or almost as important are all the recommendations that we're going to make. So does this child need to be in a standalone special education program? Can they be integrated in a school? Making sure that we're accounting for kind of the more unstructured social times that our kids have a lot of difficulty with. So recommendations for recess and lunch hour, maybe gym and things like that. Um, 
yeah, and then thinking about all those kind of observations that we're making and what that means for their ability to function in the classroom. So do they have those learning readiness skills? What are their imitation skills? Are they able to sequence things? Are they able to have good visual and verbal skills? Do they need to have things in a multimodal experience and things like that? Do they need more time for tasks? And very importantly, it's just communication between home and school. So just as take-home messages, again, no single measure can diagnose autism that's made by an experienced clinician. Um, and we need a lot of information in order to kind of put the whole child together. And so again, the most important factor in making these diagnoses is really the clinicians and you and getting all that information from everyone together.